Daniel chapter 5 is the recounting of the end of Belshazzar, the king or the sub-king of Babylon. And it is God's word to us today. So let's give our full attention. Let's listen intently to God. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in gold, the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords' wives uh, drank from them. <laughs> Sorry, let's repeat. Uh, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard that of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself. And give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast. And his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines, have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mini, Mini, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mini, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, 
You have been weighed in the balances and found waiting. Peres, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Uh, long passage and much wisdom for us. Uh, let us pray. Um, uh, let's pray together and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord for illumination, but let's also pray that he would hear our prayers uh, for, for our world and for our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you and this word, God, it humbles us, it chastens us, God, it warns us. For Father, in it we see greatness brought to nothing. We see power humbled. We see idols shown to be worthless and powerless, dead weight. And Lord, as we, your church, claim Jesus as our Lord, as our Savior, as we bow down before you, Lord, we know yet we have many idols, many idols that we give honor to, many idols that we trust in in times of great danger. God, we trust like him in wealth, in power, intangible, physical, material things that gives us strength and confidence. God, we pray that your word would pierce our hearts to receive from you grace and to rejoice in all your good works. God, as we think about all the happenings in our city, in our state, and in our world, God, in our local workplaces and neighborhoods, we pray, God, that you would see the individual needs of your congregation here, of sickness, of fear and anxiety, Lord, of conflict, and that you would bring gracious wisdom as needed, Lord, that we might represent you well, God, that we would be, Lord, not only holy and set apart in a kingdom of priests, but also, God, that we would be filled with the wisdom of your word, that we might be a benefit to those around us. God, may you... Encourage us as we fail so easily these days in our disciplines of scripture, of prayer, of even worship. God, that our hearts would be encouraged and strengthened, motivated to do those things that no one else sees, but that you see and that you reward. God, where we have failed in this, ease our conscience, lead us to repentance, and grant us help, whether from friends or church, God, or or tools that might be available to us. But Lord, help us that we would not neglect the things that are most needful, the ordinances, God, that you've placed upon your church for our good. We pray, God, that you would also care for those many who are even now becoming more and more sick. God, as University of Buffalo sees more cases and and individuals who, Lord, are not only facing a scary disease, but Lord, uh, threatened to stop many of the operations of the works in their academy. We pray, Lord, that you'd bring healing and wisdom and just guidance in these areas. We pray, Lord, for the president of our nation, for Donald Trump to recover. We pray, Lord, that you would heal him speedily. God, not because of his worth, but Lord, because of his office, Lord, that you would preserve our nation and that you would care for the many, the millions who here, God, depend on stability. We also pray, God, that as uh, we come closer and closer to an election time filled with much disagreement, not even about who we might vote for, but, Lord, how we might vote, mail-in balloting, God, and and in person, Lord, how there might be such discontent from those who will not have their way. God, we ask that you would bring a peace and a solidarity to this nation. God, that what unites us might continue to do so despite greater times of disagreement and turmoil. God, help us as Christians in this time to know what to do and what not to do. Lord, what to say and what not to say. God, we need, Lord, uh, just a greater knowledge and courage to step into tricky situations. And God, sometimes even to lose reputation or lose friends to stand for you. But Lord, we often mistake personal, God, just personal passions and ego and feelings for righteousness and justice. And God, none of us we know are perfect. God, make us to be wise and make us to be clear-sighted. But ultimately, Lord, 
Despite all these things that we may fail in, God, grant us that we might have faith in Jesus, faith in you, Lord, trusting in you for all these things, that we would be continually rejoicing before your face for the good that you have done. Speak to us now in the midst of this sermon, we ask, Lord, and uh, may this Lord's Day be for your glory, but also, God, for our benefit, that we would humble ourselves before you and trust you, God. We pray this all, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It was October 11th, 539 B.C., and these many years ago, uh, Babylon was throwing a great party, a thousand nobles in attendance, alcohol, sex, uh, many, many wealthy people uh, boozing and schmoozing. Have you ever seen movies like, you know, Batman, uh, you know, where they're having like just these baller banquet parties, champagne and shrimp on toothpicks. This is the kind of party. It's the great party of Belshazzar. A lot of us get to this passage and we start realizing you skipped a whole lot. There's a whole lot that was skipped here. There was Nebuchadnezzar, this great king, this head of gold, and then suddenly you have just a new name, Belshazzar. It almost sounds like Daniel's name, Belteshazzar. Uh, here's what happened in the meantime. Uh, we're going to see inside the narrative this one big theme. I, I told some of my friends before, you know, sometimes a one-point sermon is, is wonderful. And here's a one-point sermon for you. God will not suffer human arrogance forever. That's the one point. Uh, it's a long story to get to that one point, but that is the one point. God does not suffer arrogance forever. He doesn't suffer arrogance for those who are in power. He doesn't suffer arrogance for those who are without power. He does not put up with, he will not live with, arrogance forever. He will cut it down. And it's a question of how will he cut that down. But that's the main point. He, he will not put up with arrogance forever. Now, Belshazzar, let me give you a little bit of the background here before we jump into the story and get to that point. Belshazzar is not actually the son of Nebuchadnezzar, but he's actually more like the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Here's what happened in the meantime. Nebuchadnezzar, at some point, passed away. And uh, like a lot of sort of dynasty transitions. There was a lot of turmoil in his absence and changes of leadership. But eventually, you got Nabonidus, who's like a son, right? A son figure of Nebuchadnezzar. And then you have Nabonidus' son, who is Belshazzar. So Belshazzar is like the young guy. He's a great warrior, a great general, a great leader of warriors. He's not a very good politician, though. So he's not really good with how he talks. He's not really good with how he manages people. But he's good at fighting. His father, however, was not a particularly ambitious man. And so Nabonidus is absent from our story, which is odd, because he is technically the king of Babylon. But Nabonidus is in Tema, he's in some other place, and he's been there for like a decade at a time. So he's almost in exile because he seems to be this leader who is very much a unliked progressive. You know, a lot of times for us, we don't like progressives because they change up the social order, they bring in new things, and you know, we're very worried about that. Well, Nabonidus was a religious progressive. He tried to kind of push worship of sin, and not sin like the biblical sin, but sin, the moon goddess, the moon goddess of Babylon. And the structures that be were very much conservative Mardukians. <laughs> uh, they were conservative because we always worship Marduk. Marduk brought great success to our nation. And if you go changing all this to, to this moon god worship, well, we don't like that. We don't like the new changes you're you're talking about here. We don't like having a progressive king like this. And so he got outed, maybe just kind of socially and informally, but he left. And now his son Belshazzar, who's a good old conservative, he's bringing back Marduk worship. It's in a sense, and I'm not trying to make some direct comparisons, but it's like his campaign slogan would be make Babylon great again, right? We're going to go back to Marduk worship. We're going to bring back the glory of Nebuchadnezzar. And as he does so, here's what's happening. The story tells us that he got killed that very night. Cyrus came in and killed him. So that's very absent from the first part of the story. If he was this close and ready to take over Babylon, you'd think that that would be part of the premise, but you don't see that. So Cyrus and the Medo-Persians are camped outside the city walls of Babylon. And so the context here becomes really clear. Babylon had great overstock of food. So that means they could stand, withstand a siege for a long time. Ancient warfare, if we got more food than you, then your soldiers are going to get hungry, they're going to get restless, they're going to leave. 
We will stick it out. We'll go into quarantine mode and we will make it. They had the river Euphrates coming right into the city. So they had plenty of water. They could drink water forever. And not only that, but they were famed for extremely thick walls that you could run a chariot on top of. They would never bring down these walls. And so Belshazzar, perhaps on a, on a holiday, but perhaps just in order to celebrate and show that we're not worried, we're going to throw this big party. We're going to show not only that we are not afraid of this Persian army, but that our gods are able. Gods of gold, gods of silver, gods of wood, stone, and bronze. Basically material gods, gods of strength, gods of wealth. And so as they bring in these vessels... Here's what we see. Very soon, as he's tasting the wine and they're all getting drunk, he commands that vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar took from Jerusalem would be brought in. Now, these are sacred vessels that are kept inside the temple, which means they're, in many ways, not cultic, but like worship-oriented cups, dishes, plates. And they're filling this up with their booze, this would be as if I took the communion, you know, I don't know, thimble, and it became like a whiskey shot thing. And I know that even these, they're not sacred vessels. They're just thimbles and plastic cups. But it, it, it's purposely meant to shame the God of Israel, to show that their gods were superior. Because look, we beat you guys. We exiled your citizens. We took your temple tools. Our gods have beaten your gods. And as they do so, there's writing on the wall. Uh, the basic point that you see here, the writing on the wall is from God. Fingers of a human hand that come, inscribe on it these words. And the king shows that he is fearful. His knees knock together. Perhaps a better interpretation is he actually, his bowels become loose. He pees his pants. He becomes terrified of what it is that's being shown. And what's shown is you've been weighed, you've been measured, and your kingdom is divided. Um, what's going on here? Now, if you remember back a few chapters ago, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom was like pictured as this head of gold and that there was this prophecy, this dream that he had that successive kingdoms would become stronger in some ways, longer, but they would become in many ways diminished in their glory. So Nebuchadnezzar was kind of like this high point of a great ruler, a great civic leader. But on and on and go, and it's like the character would begin to evaporate. The virtue would begin to become diminished and less and less until eventually it was just power and strength in charge. Belshazzar is a clear example of that actually happening. And here's how you know. When Daniel talks to Belshazzar, he basically says, look, Neb was a great leader. Nebuchadnezzar had done great things. He had great power. And when he says he could kill anybody he wanted, he could he could raise up anybody he wanted. He's not saying that negatively. He's saying that as saying he's exercising the power of his office. He is enforcing rule and justice and order. And there's this kind of, it's kind of a dig on Belshazzar, but you are not a king like that. And so here's what you see. With Nebuchadnezzar, his great sin was pride because he had a lot of achievements. He had a lot of sort of character and value. He was a great man and he had a lot of pride. But going down to Belshazzar, a pretty incompetent politician, without pride and accomplishments, all he had was appearance. He was a vain man. He was a man focused on sort of arrogant appearances. And so he threw a party. He brought in golden cups and vessels from the Lord's temple. He threw them for all his nobles. He brought all his concubines. He had the great celebration, basically a drunken orgy in the face of an invading army. And this teaches us something about the nature of how pride devolves. You see, I think if you just take a moment aside, the Bible shows us a lot about the nature of human sin, especially as it goes up in power. If you actually have something to be proud about, you focus on your accomplishments, you focus on who you are, you focus on your character. But when you don't actually have that, you just focus on the appearance. You focus on what could be shown. So here are examples. You know, the, the most wealthy men in the world typically don't flaunt their wealth in the most like braggadocious ways. You know, you hear stories of people like Bill Gates driving like a Geo or something like just simple cars. They don't dress in like gold threaded suits. They just dress in, you know, Mark Zuckerberg style t-shirts with like messed up hair. And 
billions and billions of dollars. They typically focus on their achievements and their work. But I know plenty of people in California who have cars and purses and clothes that are way too expensive for them because it's about the appearance. Their homes are falling apart, their kids are not going to school, but they have the bling, they have the show. And that's Belshazzar. He's got the show, but he doesn't have any of the accomplishments, any of the character that his grandfather had. And so he called in his magicians, explained the writing on the wall. And you have to see the connection here. The magicians, the Chaldeans, the ones who he's calling in, they're like these, almost like these failed characters all throughout Daniel, aren't they? It's like you see them in the first parts of Daniel, you see them called again and again. They never seem to be able to do the job, so you almost wonder, like, why do they even have these guys? They never have any answers. They just sort of show up and say, I don't know. Maybe you should call Daniel. We don't know what this means. Uh, they can't do anything. But you have, to, you have to understand here, in their society, in their system, these were state advisors, scientists, cryptographers, mathematicians. These are the best people that run their state to actually pursue knowledge and understanding. This is the best that they have. This would be like calling their, their sort of chief intellectual advisors to come and give an answer to this. And they all come and say, we don't know. This is new to us. And so the queen, the mother, comes, and her speech is actually a very important one here because she connects us to the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, that what God had accomplished in Nebuchadnezzar's time to humble him and to reveal the glory of Israel's God to them is in this way connected now to Belshazzar. And she basically says, look, when your father, and when Nebuchadnezzar had these issues, he called Daniel, and he explained the dreams because the spirit of the gods, that important phrase, God's spirit was in him. There's something unique in him attributed to his God, to Yahweh. But when Daniel comes in, you notice there is no repentance in Belshazzar. There's no humility. Though, I mean, literally, he might have crapped himself. He's so resentful of Daniel, and he looks so down on Daniel and his God that look what he says to him, verse 13. You are that Daniel one of the exiles of Judah whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. Now that's a dig. That would be as if one said to a person who was at a vice president level of authority, who was the wisest man in their nation at a time of great need and great crisis, you're that refugee, aren't you? The one that they brought from, from that faraway podunk country? Come and give us some answers. It's very dismissive. It's pointing out his status as not a true Babylonian. And as he calls him up, he promises a reward, the same as all of his other magicians. Third in the kingdom, which is directly beneath Belshazzar. Third in the kingdom. Purple, which means glory, recognition, a chain of gold. I just almost imagine like, you know, Flava Flav when they wear like a big gold chain necklace with like a golden clock on. Like that's what he would give him, just this fat golden bling necklace. This is in many ways a picture of Belshazzar's reign. The best he can do is I can bling you up. I can pimp your clothes, whatever, right? Like I can make you fabulous. And Daniel, you can tell by the way he talks to him, has almost none of the respect he had for Nebuchadnezzar. He actually respected Nebuchadnezzar and valued his reign in some ways. He wanted the judgment on Nebuchadnezzar to actually be for his enemies. But for Belshazzar, he's much more cold. Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. That is like the most in-your-face rejection, as if he almost says, keep your gold. Right? In fact, I think maybe Daniel knew, right, as he's interpreting the writing, you're not even going to be around I'm probably not even going to keep the gold chain. This is the end. It's the end of Babylon. It's the end of the reign. Third place for how long? A day? Great. Keep it. Here's what this means, though. Here is God, and here's what he's revealing to you. The whole story is that he didn't learn from his father's example. He didn't learn. He didn't learn from his father's great achievements and the power of Yahweh to humiliate him and to bring him low. He didn't learn. He had a visual testimony of God's power and of God's judgment over pride and arrogance. He had that as an experience, but he didn't learn. 
And so the judgment against Belshazzar is actually different than Nebuchadnezzar. So God will not humble you. God will kill you. That's the judgment. God's not going to give you an opportunity to kind of have a few years to come to your senses and to repent. Basically, the writing on the wall is all the warning you're going to get. You got about five hours. And we know the Belshazzar didn't repent. Belshazzar didn't learn. But in this case, it was judgment. And here's, here's the riddle. Meanie, meanie, tickle, and parson, or tickle. I mean, I know that's pronounced differently. But basically, in the actual language, these are measurements of weight. They're measurements of, of weight, meaning measurements of, like, uh, wealth. And so when he says that, uh, it's a mina, mina, tekel, and paris. Basically, it's um, a mina is a, a measurement of, of great wealth. A tekel is one-sixtieth a mina. So imagine saying, like, $100,000 to like, I'm horrible at math. What is 1 60th of $100,000? About like uh, $3,000, no, $2,000, 1,000, okay, so about a 60th of however much that wealth is. A, a tekel is 1 60th of the mina, and a paris is a half a tekel. So you don't need to know the weights and measurements. It's just saying, look, valuable and rich and loaded much, much, much less. And then by the time you get to the third, like barely a few bucks. And what the kind of the wordplay that Daniel picks up on is there's a similar sound in, in the language here to basically numbered. So meaning the days are numbered. Your time is numbered. You could count it. Numbered, numbered, and then weighed or measured, put in the balance, and then Paris, which is divided, meaning and now given over to somebody else. So there, again, I told you there's some language things that they do to try to make these things interesting that for us takes like two minutes of explanation. But he's saying, look, here's who you are as a human. Your grandparents were great. You or your, your father way, 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 way less, and you are half of your dad. And numbered are your days, numbered, you've been weighed, and everything under you is going to be given to somebody else. That's the judgment. And that's exactly what happened. Verse 29 is the end here. Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck. A proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. The last thing that he would proclaim in the kingdom was Daniel is the third ruler. And the verse 30 is very simple. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. There's a little bit of a question there. Darius doesn't seem like it's Cyrus. We know historically Cyrus took over the kingdom. Cyrus is the one that executed Belshazzar. Darius the Mede might actually be a title of that kind of a king that's coming in. Um, so we know it to be the same person. Uh, there, are, there were other Darius rulers, um, you know, in the future. But Cyrus, the great judge of God, um, the one who was even in the scriptures called, in some ways, the anointed of God, the one who would come to do his will of judgment, took out Belshazzar. As a long explanation, let me just boil it all down for us. What does this mean? Look, the, the sin of Belshazzar was his arrogance, is that he felt and believed himself to be worthy, honorable, and glorious, and particularly his great mistake that his gods, his gods of silver, his gods of gold, his gods of stone, bronze, and wood were superior to the gods of Israel, and that that was judged. That was judged. As Daniel said, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are your, all your ways you have not honored. And this was his downfall. You know, I told you guys, one of my favorite series of movies is The Godfather. And there's a scene in The Godfather 2 where Al Pacino's character, uh, Michael Corleone, was negotiating this big, huge business deal with his partner, Al Al, uh, Roth, Hyman Roth. They're in Cuba right before a great revolution takes place. And they're in the, the, uh, 
basically the, the president's palace. There's a party, there's champagne, it's a New Year celebration. But right in the middle of it, these soldiers walk in and basically tell him, the rebels have broken in, they're going to take over the city, and you need to leave by tonight. And so this great party scatters, and you see that the whole nation that looked stable, that would become the business of the future, that Michael Corleone could, could build a whole dynasty of his family on, was suddenly gone because the nation was unstable. Well, God's, sort of God's, how would you say it, his diagnoses of all great nations is that there's a fundamental instability that they can be gone literally in a day. That whatever mankind might take pride in, and particularly here is the pride of, in some ways, national strength, is misplaced because only God raises kings and takes down kings, and only God is worthy of ultimate honor and worship. And that pride comes before a fall and that God does not suffer arrogance. Let me apply that in a couple ways for us. Um, what do we learn here from Belshazzar's account? Let me give you a few ones. They're, they're a little scattered, but I think they all draw from the text. Number one, good preaching doesn't guarantee repentance. This should warn us. Good preaching doesn't guarantee repentance. Belshazzar is shown as having every opportunity to learn, and he didn't. He saw the great humiliation and ascendancy of his grandfather, and he didn't learn. He saw the writing on the wall, and though it terrified him, it didn't lead to repentance. And in fact, the great prophet of his time, Daniel, explained and told him the judgment to come, and he still didn't repent. There's no sign of that. All of Nebuchadnezzar's stories seem to end with like a doxology, right? The, the, this God of the heavens, this God of Daniel. There's this recognition to the fact that by the end of chapter Chapter 4, he's actually singing a praise song to God. Belshazzar, you don't see that. You just see him probably begrudgingly honoring Daniel, giving him the gold, giving him the dress. But you don't see repentance. You see, in the end, what killed him was not ignorance, it was stubbornness. And Christian, you and I need to be warned of that in Belshazzar's story. What's going to kill us eventually, and I'm talking about like final destruction, final failure of our Christian faith. It's not going to be because you had a substandard church, a substandard preacher, or coronavirus changing the dynamics of your spiritual disciplines in life. What it's going to be ultimately is you hear, but you don't repent. You listen, but stubbornness locks you into a mode of life that you refuse to change from. You will not abandon your idols. And so you stay the course even though God warns you. And Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar give us two drastically different ways God treats people. With Nebuchadnezzar, it looks like he gave him every opportunity possible. He sends him signs. He doesn't kill him right away, even though he's you know, in the middle of martyring God's servants. He sends him dream after dream. Nebuchadnezzar still goes to his magicians, but God still leaves him Daniel. Eventually, God humbles him and takes out everything he has so that he could raise up that stump to repent and be, be saved from the judgment. God gave him every opportunity. With Belshazzar, almost none. He gets a last-minute message at the party before his death. And ultimately, the challenge was not, again, ignorance, because Belshazzar was warned, however, in the life of his grandfather all his life all the stories around the palace, everything the queen would have told him. He ignored it. Christian, let me ask for, for us. We have the Holy Scriptures. We have the testimony of those who've gone before us. We have, in fact, the testimony of one another and of many Christians who've described the patience and mercy of God as sometimes his harsh discipline in life. We've seen people live and pass away and die, sometimes in faith, sometimes, in, sometimes not. We have so many examples of God's work both from his word and from life and experience. And the question is not, has he spoken enough? The question is, are we listening and are we repenting when we hear? I sometimes wonder for us if we're waiting for like this miraculous Nebuchadnezzar kinds of moments. 
You know, like God will literally put me with the donkeys and then I'll look up to the sky and light will break through and I'll repent and I'll be in tears and I'm going to sing songs. It's going to be this fantastic experience of repentance and conversion and God's going to do these crazy miracles and I'm going to blow up in my faith. When the reality is, it's far more likely you're here most Sundays, you're hearing the preaching of God's holy scriptures, you're experiencing things that are God's messages to you. The problem is not that God's not speaking, that God's not teaching. It's that we are resisting and that we're choosing to ignore. There's great danger in this. And God's warning, symbolically here in the death of Belshazzar, he may not have you be conquered by Persians, but he will end your life in judgment if you continue in unrepentance, if you continue to ignore him and his word. Secondly, let me point out, there's a judgment on the gods of Babylon not just Marduk, but here specifically stated as the gods of silver and gold, bronze, wood, stone. Now, what, what, is this, what does this teach us? Babylon was a short-lived kingdom, about less than 100 years. It was not a, a long-lived kingdom, but it was a great creation. It was built, it was organized, it was engineered. It was not only broad in terms of its size. I mean, Babylon, the city, might have been the first city in all of humanity that had more than 200,000 people. It was a great city, a marvel of a city, thickly walled, splendor and glory and bling and shine and hanging gardens and gold and many peoples and cultures. And we could walk down the streets of Babylon and find any kind of food that you wanted in all the world right there in that city. And it was brought down in a night. What does that, what does that teach us? I want to I want you to walk with me for just one step here. The story of Belshazzar exposes, in many ways, the folly of national idolatry. When you place your final hope or your final despair in the life of a city or nation or kingdom, there is great foolishness in this. For Belshazzar to have his gods be silver, gold, stone, basically it's kind of like saying, my God is what I see, this great city. Stone, 20 feet across, let's see those Persians get through that. That's my God. It's practical, it's military defense. Money, even if we're in trillions of dollars of debt, we have the financial resources to do whatever we want in the world. Stone and bronze, and in fact, the splendor. Look at our lifestyle. Look at how we live. No one, in, no one in the known world lives like we live. No one has access to this kind of pleasure and this kind of luxury and this kind of bling and food and life. No one lives like us. And as foolishness was thinking, because these things are powerful now, they'll stay powerful. They'll stay strong. They'll protect us forever. If you don't know the story, the way that the Persians got into the city, the way that they actually broke in, it was genius. They basically diverted the Euphrates into like this basin, so the water went there. And the Euphrates coming into Babylon then was basically about thigh high. So they took some Persian commandos, they snuck them through the riverbed, and they walked through the, the sort of the river archway of Babylon. And while everyone's partying and drunk, they took over. In some ways, the very gods that they worshipped, the gods that let them drink and enjoy life in the face of danger, were likely, according to like Xenophon and other historians, that was why they got taken over. They were busy partying. They were so proud and self-confident that they just snuck in under the walls. And that has to be for us an illustration of the kind of foolishness that we are also prone to do. One commentator said, basically, what do you see Belshazzar doing? He's feasting on the edge of the grave. There's a great danger in front of him, and he's distracting himself with pleasure and party and rejoicing in his gods. And Christians, we ought also to be warned. The same thing often happens when we see threat before us. Civil war, you know, Trump and Biden and all the disenfranchised people who feel like they, they didn't win, and burning in the streets, fighting, you know, get your guns ready, stock up on water and food, right? When you see that coming, What's our temptation? It's to go back to the same gods that we thought helped us out in the past five years. 
Well, if drinking always got me through those, well, it'll get me through this too. It's suicidal foolishness. If we think, well, money, money always got me through my life. Money always made sure that I was okay. Money always kind of ensured that I would be one of the ones who made it at the end. Well, this is the very thing that God is judging, saying that's actually not true when I come to judge. And that's not been true for many who found that their money suddenly became as nothing. They couldn't buy an egg with hundreds and thousands of dollars of their money because when a society collapses, there is no help but God. You see, Belshazzar, though he didn't know, was absolutely vulnerable. And what he didn't understand is that his idols, the things that he trusted in, would be useless to save him. And this is where the Bible reveals to us a deeper layer of what idolatry really is. What is idolatry? Idolatry is not just burning something in front of a statue. You see, what they show is idolatry is ultimately what you're going to turn to when you feel like your life is threatened. When everything is falling apart, when your anxiety is at the maximum red line level, what do you turn to? Belshazzar only had gold, wine, women. That's what he turned to, and it killed him. When you are stressed beyond belief and you feel like your life might be over, what do you gravitate to for strength and comfort and confidence for your future? You see, for Daniel, it was clearly it was Yahweh, it was God, because he's in control of history. Babylon's over, and in fact, he only lived a year of Cyrus' reign, so it's, it's done. But for us, whatever you turn to in times of need to give you strength, comfort, and confidence, that is the God. That's the idol. You don't have to worship it day to day. It may not even be on your mind, but it's always the background. It's always what stabilizes you in uncertainty. And brothers and sisters, we've got we to repent of that. If, if the Lord points that out to you, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your name, Maybe it's church and the relationships you have here, or it could be money, or it could be your health. Whatever it is that you think, ultimately, as long as I have this, I'll be okay. Whatever that is that the Lord points out to you, repent of that unless it's Jesus. Literally, unless it's God and his grace and his mercy. If it is not, ultimately, no matter what happens, God will be with me. God will be merciful. God will save me. That's all Christians are allowed to hope in. But if it's God and something, God plus a retirement account, or God plus my family, or God plus whatever. Then the application of Daniel is clear. Repent of that, because it's going to kill you when need really comes. As good as they may be on their own. Finally and third, and this is the simple and fast one. If God has not ended your life yet, be thankful and repent while you can. Uh, Belshazzar had a few hours, and he was probably too drunk to even to do much with it. He, he got captured that very night. In contrast, he gave a lot of opportunities, both to Nebuchadnezzar, he gives opportunities to many of us, and in fact, the scriptures bring this up again and again. If today you hear his voice, salvation is still within your grasp. If you're hearing God's word now, he's giving you an opportunity. He doesn't just preach into the darkness, into emptiness. He's preaching to to get a response. Not just me. God speaks to you to get you to do something, which is namely to trust in Jesus, to repent of your sins, to repent of your idols, to repent of your own righteousness. If you hear him, it's time to repent. You still have time. The very fact that this ends with death shows us, so after that, Belshazzar had no more chances. He was literally probably torn up in pieces and hung up around the city walls. He was gone. So his chance was done. That was his story. By contrast, everybody who reads Daniel 5, all the Israelite exiles who read the judgment of God on this pagan king, is hearing the echo of God's prophets in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, in all the Old Testament. It is still time. There is still time to turn to God. And this is no more truer that when you look all the way to Revelation 18 and the resurgence of Babylon as an idea, as this kind of city nation, that the evil and wicked world system that stands against God and his kingdom 
economically, morally, politically, spiritually, that that kingdom is in some sense resurgent and reborn. That Babylon exists as a kind of a secular opposition to God all throughout the church age. And so that Christians who now find themselves living not in Babylon, but in the United States, living in a culture oftentimes vacillating towards different forms of secularism, sometimes national conservative secularism on one side, and on the other side, liberal progressive secularism, that we live in our own Babylon. But we look to one who is greater than Daniel. And here, here is where I think the text leads us ultimately to Jesus. You see, a Hebrew exile comes out of nowhere to confront the powers of, their, of his world, the sins of blasphemy, mockery, arrogance, pride, and idolatry. And Daniel would not be bought off or seduced by their idols, by gold. He didn't care. And in Daniel was the Holy Spirit to interpret dreams, to explain riddles, to solve problems, to preach to power. And it's Jesus who says, for his day and his ministry, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. And of Jesus' listeners, they saying of Christ, no man ever spoke like this. They also recognized in Christ is a wisdom and a spirit of God unlike any other. They saw something like Daniel in him in a secular, maybe not secular, but at least a fallen society. And yet Jesus demonstrates not only that he's the better Daniel, but that he's actually the better king. You see, look at Belshazzar. His last supper, literally his last supper, there was splendor, there was party, there was pleasure. He was spending it while he had it. He was burning it before it was gone. That was his mindset. If this is one life to live, then it's YOLO. Let's, let's drink it all. Let's live it all up while we can. But look at Jesus' last supper. Humility, service to his disciples, anticipating the judgment to come, but not with a YOLO attitude, but with loving sacrifice. And Isaiah tells us he didn't have gold, silver, glitz, or glitter. He didn't have outward majesty. He looked ordinary, like you. That's what Jesus looked like. And yet he knew that in submission to God that his feast would be on the other side of death. His nobles that would come to his party would actually be us. You know, beggars, thieves, prostitutes, tax collectors. This pretty ragtag, janky group of people for a party. But to be on the other side of death because Christ himself would defeat death, defeat the enemies outside the wall. And Jesus, on the cross, weighed, measured, and his kingdom united, kept together. Jesus is our better king. And so, brothers and sisters, I encourage you, don't look to the election for salvation. Don't look to the election for the apocalypse. Don't look to anything working in our secular world system as ultimately your final salvation. Be on guard for idolatry, particularly the idolatry that says something that will happen in this next year in these spheres of life will be our salvation, will be our good, will change things. Ultimately, God calls us to look to him and his kingdom and to live as exiles here and now, even working toward the good of our time and knowing, even still, the U.S. canon will fall, but God and his kingdom will last forever because Christ is its king. Let's trust in him and let's obey only him and give him alone the worship. Let's pray together and let's prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, God, we ourselves have been guilty of idolatry, some of it personal. God, our personal idols of wealth, status, sex, pleasure. God, we find our hearts diminished under them. But also, Lord, like Belshazzar and the many who celebrated with him, we've also been confused and at times idolatrous of ideologies, of political parties. God, so much so that we can wish death upon our enemies and we can wish not only improvements to our society, but God, much more insidiously, vengeance on those who have angered us. Ultimately, Lord God, the only hope we have is that you are in control. And that, Lord, 
Jesus' kingdom shall never end, for its king is worthy, and the kingdom of Christ shall never have its king numbered and weighed and divided. Lord, the cross showed him for who he was, showed him for who he is, a worthy king who loves his subjects and would die to save them. God, may we now, as citizens of his kingdom, humbly submit. And God, as we hear the preaching of your word, as we see the identification of our idols and a call to repent of them, Lord, as we are summoned to give honor to the true king, let us not delay. Lord, let us not wait for another chance. But today, as we hear your voice, God, lead us to repentance. Lead us to belief, to the joyful taking on of his cross so that ultimately we may dine at his table. God, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us. And we ask, God, that you would make us to be wise in these things. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen.